Welcome to SMCC Lehigh. We are one church, five locations and two languages, and you are blessed to be here at the Lehigh campus this morning. Uh, my name is Tim. Usually you'll find me in the back uh, banging on the keys, making sure that everything's going okay, or teaching a class, or taking a class to work on my head. Uh, but about seven years ago, I was here kicking the tires. And uh, I would sneak in the back and around the side and try and not get seen for about the first three months. In retrospect, wearing glow-in-the-dark glasses and neon shirts didn't work really well for that. Um, but one day, my wife filled out a connection card with my name on it. So I got a call from the pastor shortly thereafter. And that's when I got connected. Um, that's when I finally found my people. You know who you are. Um, and I got connected and, and I started to really grow in church. So I will encourage you, fill out one of those connection cards, get one of those phone calls. It's a great opportunity to start to plug into the community. Speaking of community, we had a great event on Friday, the Fall Festival. We had over 300 people here. There were pretty pies and fabulous chili. It was a wonderful experience. The kids loved the bounce houses. I tried them, but then they collapsed. So uh, not gonna do that next year. If you missed it, you missed out. So work on coming to the next event, which is our trunk or treat, uh, October 26th. We're gonna meet at the Draper campus. If you want to have a trunk, if you want to volunteer and usher cars around or people around, whatever, you can plug in with the QR codes behind me, and it's gonna be a fabulous experience as well. If you are of the female persuasion, we have other opportunities for you to get plugged in. There's a worship night on November 2nd. Um, I, I don't get to come to that, and I'm really sad because worshiping is my favorite part of coming to church. Um, but I'm happy for you to be able to get together and experience that. Make sure you sign up and uh, get plugged in. One last thing this week, and then we'll be done with announcements. We have an Engage Night coming up in a couple of weeks on November 17th. Uh, that's an opportunity for you to, again, plug in, find out what's going on here at SMCC Lehigh, what things are coming in the future, how you can take next steps and join in the community and get engaged. There's a QR code up there for that as well. Uh, we do have childcare. So if you're coming, please register so that we can be prepared for that childcare. And uh, now we'll go ahead and turn the time back over to the worship team. Go ahead and stand to your feet as we worship our God. Give 
so worthy of our praise. We want to lift our voices to him and just let him know how much we love him. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed. By heavy stone, the Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days. We will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, our God. 
robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're singing a song this morning. This one is called, Oh, Praise the Name. So I Googled it. Praise is to literally exalt or to lift high. And I can't think of much more worthy of praise than an action like this, that God knowing, even before we were born, people would not accept him, but some would. In taking that risk, Jesus willingly sacrificed himself for us just so that we could have a chance at eternal life with him. And when I, when I think of that, it's certainly worthy of praise because I don't know if I can do that. So as we come into this next chorus, it's going to be, oh, praise the name. If you would, sing it out. come through this morning and just, Lord, thanking you for this time. God, I just pray as we come into the next part of our service that you would be with Trevor and then, Lord, speak your word through him that somebody here would get something today that we could use and receive in our lives. God, I just pray that you would continue to keep your hand on all parts of this service. God, we just ask you this in your name. Amen. Hey, you guys can be seated. For those of you who haven't met, my name's Trevor. I serve as one of the pastors here. Just want to say thanks so much for joining us this Sunday. Thanks for trusting us with a portion of your Sunday morning. Now, I'd like to kind of open up today with a, just an idea, a truth that I think we can all agree on no matter where we're coming from, no matter what we believe about God or the Bible. Uh, this is something that I think we can all start from common ground with, this idea that community builds confidence. Community builds confidence, sometimes for better and sometimes not for better. So if I could share just an example of my own life. Before moving here, my wife and I, we lived in Chicago. And one of the things I always wanted to do while living there was run the Chicago Marathon. And close to the end of our time there, got the chance to do it. And uh, as I was running it, anybody run like a race that's uh, longer? Half, mar half marathon? Marathoners? Anyone in the room? All right, good stuff, good stuff. Trent, one, maybe one day, Trent, you'll get there, so... <laughs> no, so, um, okay, so first half of that race, for those who raised your hands, it was probably fun and good, right, and pleasant, and the second half of that race is painful. How would you describe it? Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's good. It's not what I expected, but I think that about sums it up. So, <laughs> 
thank you, whoever that came from. But, uh, so, yeah, the, 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 my experience was the first half of the race, we're running through neighborhoods in Chicago where we had friends. We knew a bunch of people who lived there. And so at, at like regular kind of intervals throughout the race, I would see people along the side who were just cheering for the race in general, uh, see people that I knew and they knew me. And so immediately they'd start kind of like, you know, saying my name and cheering and clapping. And I'd get this boost of energy where I'd start running faster, weaving through traffic, passing people. In the first half of this race, I was crushing it. I was like, I'm doing so well. This is great. I... And there's no way I'm going to win this thing, but maybe, maybe I'll get the time that I'm actually shooting for. And then the second half of the race, where my body began to fail me, that also happened to coincide with uh, basically the course changing to where all of a sudden, for the second half of this entire race, we're weaving through neighborhoods that I don't know anybody. And uh, all of a sudden, my cheering squad is gone, my community is gone, the people encouraging me are gone. And that was a very, very painful second half to that race, which is why I haven't done another one since then. But um, so, uh, yeah, and I think what that shows is both this idea that it's true that community does build confidence, whether we're running a race or whether we're a high schooler jumping off of some, you know, cliff into uh, a pond, having people cheering us on while we do that, while we belly flop our way in there, that can be a helpful thing. Uh, and at the same time, if you lack community, you will lack confidence that a lack of uh, community oftentimes results in us having less confidence as we go about navigating the challenges and the decisions and the relationships of our lives. And so this is significant because so often when we approach things with a lack of confidence, we end up kind of shying back from opportunities or end up stumbling in the midst of our responsibilities or we don't kind of step into the, the doors that are open for us, that a lack of confidence actually can detract from our lives in some pretty significant ways. And a lack of confidence can be the result of a lack of community. And so it's worth delving into the subject just to consider if confidence really does matter this much, then what does it look like to build a community uh, that can continue to kind of foster that for me? And I think that if we're just honest, probably many of us are facing challenges around this area specifically of community. Because I think many of us have likely relocated, like myself, from somewhere else in the country and uh, call Utah home now, but we haven't always. And in doing that and making that move, we left behind friends and family and the community that really did support and encourage us. Uh, but maybe, maybe we didn't relocate geographically, but there was more of a kind of spiritual relocation where because of certain decisions that we made, uh, certain alterations in what we believe, we left the community that we used to belong to. And with that, we've lost the sort of strength and support that we had from that community before. And on the other side of that, the question can be, you know, we, we feel the loss of that. And so the question can be, how do I get that back? Today, as we continue our series with confidence, uh, where, we're where we're walking through this letter called 1 Thessalonians, one of the letters in the New Testament, I really want to explore that subject in particular. Because this letter is written to a, a group of people who uh, loved and believed in and followed Jesus in the first century in the city of Thessalonica. It's written to them by, um, the letter's written by a man named Paul, who was a significant leader in the early church and authored a lot of the New Testament, including this letter. And, and all throughout, you know, they're going through difficulties, and he's writing in a way that is leading them into further confidence in their trust in Jesus and in the lives that they're living. And in this chapter in particular, he delves into the subject of community in connection with confidence. And so the hope is that uh, even though this was written some 2,000 years ago in another culture on another continent in a language vastly different from our own, that there will still be something to glean from this that can help us when it comes to building our own sense of community within our lives for our own good. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you have a physical Bible with you, you're welcome to join me there. If you've got a fake digital Bible, uh, you're welcome to join me there as well. And uh, if you don't have either of those, they'll be up on the, the screen, so you, you'll be able to track along just fine. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, picking it up at verse 1. So Paul says, uh, so when we could stand it no longer, being separated from the Thessalonians, that's what he's referring to. When we could stand being separated from you no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, a city in Rome, or city in Greece. He said, we sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. 
Right, so if you kind of walk back the timeline, you can kind of situate this letter within its context, within the broader story. Right? So Paul and Timothy and some other companions, they're traveling throughout the Roman Empire, visiting different cities uh, so they can introduce people who live in these cities to an accurate understanding of who Jesus is and present to them the invitation that Jesus presents to all of us, uh, the invitation into the way of life that he uh, that he offers to us. And so in their journey, we read about this in the book of Acts, one of the other books within the New Testament that gives us the history of the early church. We see that Paul and his companions, they go to the city of Philippi first, and then they go to Thessalonica. And then after Thessalonica, they go to the city of Berea. They're forced to leave Thessalonica because some hostility that arises in the city uh, in opposition to them. They go to Berea, and then they go to Athens. And when they're in Athens, what Paul is saying is like, we just couldn't take not knowing how you were doing and what was happening. So we took one of us, we took Timothy, and we sent him back to the city. Because Paul was at a point where he was kind of a, a notorious person at this uh, moment in time. He had some heat in the city of this Thessalonica. So he himself couldn't go back, but Timothy was a little more under the radar, so they sent him back. And then on the other side of that, Timothy returns to Paul and brings back the report of how things are going in Thessalonica. And it's after Paul receives that report that he drafts this letter and sends it back to them. So that's kind of the, the overall context and situation here. And he's saying that we couldn't take the separation. Because again, first century, they can't just, you know, open their phone and Marco Polo them and see, man, how are you doing? Uh, so he has to send Timothy. And uh, in verse 3, when he picks up again, he says some interesting things, right? So verse 3, he says, we sent Timothy so that, for this reason, for this purpose, so that um, no one would be unsettled by these trials, by these challenges, by these difficulties that you're facing. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith, about your trust in Jesus. I was afraid that in some way the tempter, that's your spiritual enemy, um, had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain, that you might have walked away from a trusting faith in Jesus. So he says some interesting things within this passage, right? That on the one hand, he talks about trials. And I think this is worth um, spending a minute on because so often I think we have a certain lens through which we interpret the, the bad things that happen in our lives, right? When, when things go awry with our relationships, when things go off with our health, when things happen that we wish wouldn't happen within our lives, things that you could kind of put under the category of suffering and challenges and difficulties. I think so often if we've been kind of brought up within religion or trained by religion, we look at those things and think, man, this is either because I, I did something wrong and God is punishing me for it and that's why this is happening, or I just haven't been, I haven't been good enough to kind of be exempt from the hard things of this life. And, and so often we can navigate these things with that understanding and that is so damaging to our relationship with God because that's not at all the relationship that Jesus actually invites us into. And you can even see that within this passage that uh, Paul is saying that trials are a regular part of life, that they are not uh, something that happen when we stray from the path. They are on the path itself. And yet, the promise that Jesus makes to us is not that if we're good enough, he'll remove the bad things, but, but rather the bad things will be there in this life. We will have difficulties. We will have challenges and suffering will occur, but the promise is that he will be with us in all of it to sustain us, to strengthen us, to help us to persevere, to comfort and encourage us in all of the challenges that we go through. The promise is not to remove our suffering, but rather to be with us in the midst of it. And so I think that can be sort of a helpful uh, perspective correction. But then on the other hand, what we do see is that um, Paul knows that Jesus is with them, but on the other hand, he's like, I, I couldn't take not knowing what was happening. And so we sent Timothy to you and that tells us something about the power of relationships to help us in the midst of the difficulties that we go through. And as we continue reading, we, we begin to see that even more. So picking it up with the next couple of verses, verses 6 and 7, he says, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith, your trust in Jesus, and your love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith, because of your trust in Jesus. I think what's so fascinating about this is that what we see is, on the one hand, what you might expect is that 
Paul and Timothy and the other companions who were with them, that it's kind of a one-way street where they're the ones who are kind of solid and more mature and in a place of having walked with Jesus longer. So they're the ones who are pouring into the Thessalonians who are newer to this. And it's sort of a one-way street. And yet what we see here is that Paul is describing as well how much he was encouraged when Timothy brought back this good news of how well they're doing, of how they're caring for one another, loving one another well, how they're continuing to live in community and hold to this trust in Jesus, that it's a two-way street, that Paul, as he faces these difficulties and these challenges, he needs their encouragement through relationship just as much as they need it through him. And so it's mutual in this way. And I, I think the truth is we actually see this a lot within our culture, that there's many different examples, right? We see it when we look at this document, this letter written some 2,000 years ago, and we also see it when we look to some of the most popular uh, television shows of today. So, so if you would, um, you know, I think sitcoms are one area that kind of get into this really well, but uh, sitcoms or TV shows that display relationships, that kind of display the strength of friendship. Could, could you, if I'm looking for a little participation this morning, if you could share with me what is a sitcom that you have really enjoyed or a show that you've enjoyed that, that really displays kind of the power of friendship and connection and community? What, what do you got for me? Big Bang Theory. Yeah, okay. Well, I heard another one. Friends? Friends. Love friends. So, so good. In so many ways, I think that's why Friends is such a powerful and such a, a meaningful show to so many people because it's this depiction of these friends who are with and for each other and so many of the ups and downs of life. Anything else? What was that? Residents? Okay, residents. And then back there? New girl. Yeah, okay. Ah, great. Another classic one. Absolutely. Friends living in an apartment. You got something? You're being volunteered. You're being volunteered, yeah. <laughs> Yellowstone? <laughs> Yeah, I've never seen that because I'm a Christian, so. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. I've watched it. I've watched it. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally kidding. Uh, Kevin Costner, how can you not, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, another one that I think is good, especially maybe the young folk in the room will resonate with this, is uh, Outer Banks is one that I think is a really good depiction of community and relationships and people being strengthened through those, through the challenges of you know, treasure hunting and all the things that can go wrong with that. So, so with all of this, uh, what we see is a lot of different depictions of how significant relationships and community are for us to be able to do life well. And yet, I think if we're honest, it seems that more and more as time goes on, relationships just continue to be more and more difficult to actually uh, build and sustain and even lean into the relationships that we see depicted on TV to have that same type of community in our actual lives is something that so often is so challenging. And I think the question is, why? And I want to get into some practicals, right, and talk about how do we do that well. But before we do that, I think one of the things that can be helpful is just to do a little bit of analysis on what actually is community, what forms community, what shapes it in a helpful way within our lives. So just to break it down, I think there's three different aspects to community that we can kind of use these as a lens for looking at it and breaking it down. So three aspects to, uh, to community. There's shared space, shared beliefs, and shared behaviors. That if you look at a community uh, and however it's structured, there is some combination of one or two or all three of these things that are present. And that's actually what brings about the relationships and the connection within that particular community. So one example of this is for the very first time in my adult life, I'm very excited to have made the investment, we've made the investment as a family to be able to watch NFL football on Sunday. And I get it. I get the appeal. It's so fun. You get some chips and some dip and you just sit on the couch and you watch other people do things and it's exciting and it's wonderful. And I have to say, I'm going to let you in on what my team is. And, you know, we're talking about community and connection. For some of us, this will be a moment, this will be a big step forward in our relationship. For others, we might take a step back. Uh, but, but I'm going to go ahead and just let you know. Uh, so I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And you would assume maybe that that makes me a Lions fan. But Detroit was like 12 hours away. Green Bay was two hours away. That's right. That's right. There we go. There we go. I think a couple of people booed in the first service. So, um, but <laughs> yeah, so I'm a, I'm a, a you know, a 
yeah, green and gold. I am a Green Bay Packer fan, and it has been so fun. And my wife is a Lions fan, and our kids don't know what to do. Uh, so that, that is where we're at. Uh, but it's been so fun. But I'll say this, that when it comes to community, if you look at like cheering for a sports team, majority of the time you have shared beliefs and you have shared behaviors, that we cheer for the same team, we watch the same team, we believe that this same team is the greatest team each and every year, regardless of how they actually do. And so we've got two of the three, uh, but we're lacking the first one, that, that piece of shared space, unless we find ourselves at Lambeau and then you've got the trifecta and everything is there, right? Um, but so often, I think what, where you find communities to be lacking is that they have one or two, but not all three of these. And you could put it like this, a false sense of community, or even uh, softer language would be that a diluted sense of community, or a weakened sense of community is found when you have one aspect of community, but not all aspects. When you have shared space, but not the others. When you have shared uh, beliefs, but not the others. Like another example would be shared space and shared behavior. One of the things I uh, enjoyed, uh, have enjoyed for a lot of my life is just playing basketball, right? Going to an open gym and showing up with kind of the same group of guys week in and week out and playing basketball. And there has never been a moment where I'm like, you know, where we're shooting teams and I'm like, man, I've really been struggling with this. That has never happened. I've never done that and I've never heard anyone else do that. And if I did do that, they would probably say, yeah, that's tough. Um, you're up. Do you want to shoot now? Because we've got to get our teams ready and, and let's play the game, right? That's not really a space in which relationships move forward in that way. And so a diluted sense of community is found when you have one aspect of community, but not all aspects of community. Just some examples of this. A diluted, diluted communities. I think social media often is this. Religion uh, can be this. Because when you look at the, um, I think when you get into beliefs, sometimes religion can be so kind of, demanding in a way um, that it's almost like coercively everyone believes the same thing because there isn't space to actually be honest about where you really and truly are at. Uh, number three, sports and clubs. Um, what well, we talked about. Neighborhoods are shared space, but oftentimes not much beyond that. And then work is oftentimes a place where there's shared behaviors and shared um, space, but not always shared beliefs. So these are places in which we have a lot of connections and relationships, but so often the relationships there don't actually seem to offer what it is that we really are needing within our lives. And you could say, well, how, how significant is that really? You know, so I don't have a group of friends to sit in a coffee shop with, you know, every single day and chat about what's happening. Is that really the end of the world? Because who does have that? Well, the Surgeon General says this about it. This is from 2023, even before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, even prior to that massive cultural disruption, which really did, uh, you know, sever so many of our connections and our relationships, even prior to that, approximately half of U.S. adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness. That's one in two. That's half of this room prior to 2020. And I can only imagine numbers have risen since then. Uh, disconnection fundamentally affects our mental, physical, and societal health. In fact, Loneliness and isolation increase the risk for individuals to develop mental health challenges in their lives. And lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to level, levels comparable to smoking daily. It almost sounds like a vaccine ad, right? That like loneliness is bad and it does bad things. And, and so often we, I think, um, have these sort of diluted communities and diluted relationships that maybe scratch the itch a little bit, but ultimately they don't provide what we're really looking for. And sometimes they can keep us in this place where we have enough where we think we can get by, but not enough to where we want to really get what we need to be able to thrive. You could put it like this, that false community only inflames insecurity, insignificance, and discontentment. Now the question is, uh, what do we do about it? If we know that loneliness is that significant, if we know that feeling alienated in the midst of our struggles, if we know that feeling alone is really that significant, what do we do about it? To answer that, I'd like to actually go back to the second half of chapter 3 in 1 Thessalonians to see what Paul offers them, to see what we can draw from that in answering this question for us. So, picking it up at verse 8, this is what we see. Paul says, For now we really live. Since you are standing firm in the Lord, Paul's saying on the other side of receiving this encouragement, this uh, connection to you, of knowing that you're doing well and receiving the encouragement and being strengthened by that, on the other side of receiving this from you, now we really live. We've stepped into the life that which is truly, the life that is truly life. He goes on to say, how can we thank God enough for you? 
in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith and your trust in Jesus. He's saying we don't even know how to thank God enough for the joy that we have in you because it's so significant. And then Paul does something here that he does in many of his letters. He gets basically so excited that he stops talking to them and instead just kind of erupts into this moment of prayer. And this is what he writes. He says in verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. He's saying basically God would you allow me to go to see them. And if you actually read the history of the, this, how this unfolds within the book of Acts, you see that Paul does at some point make his way back to them later on within this journey. So this prayer is answered in a positive way. Uh, verse 12, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy Ones. Now, we see, I think, several factors that are significant aspects of community within this passage, within what Paul is praying for on their behalf, and even what he's describing within their community, and even the relationship he has with them. So, I think you could put it like this, that gospel community includes these features that we see even within this short little passage. We see gratitude um, on the one hand, that Paul's saying, we don't even know how to be thankful enough. So, you see gratitude first off. Um, so, gospel community includes gratitude. You also see joy within this, um, that he's saying, we don't even know how to thank God for the joy that we have in you. You see prayer, that he spontaneously erupts into prayer with them. Uh, you see him longing to be present with them because that's such a significant aspect of community. And he's praying that their presence with one another would also continue to be that which is marked by love. And then finally, he closes the prayer asking for their holiness to be something that continues to grow and develop because ultimately their holiness is for their good to be able to honor Jesus and all of the decisions, all the relationships, all the challenges that they navigate in this life, to be able to go through all of that in a way that is honoring to Jesus is holy and is for their good. And I think ultimately you could summarize it all like this, that when people treat you the way Jesus treats you, it's an experience of the gospel. And what Paul is praying is that they would continue to do this among them. That when someone treats you, responds to you in the same way that Jesus does. That is an experience of the gospel. And this is something that we touched on last week in talking about how so often our emphasis can be placed on understanding things correctly. And that is vital, right? To have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is, what he's done, and to know what the gospel message truly is. But then even beyond that, what we talked about is that just as that is important to understand the gospel, it's just as important to also experience it within the context of community. And I think you could put it like this, that so many of us, we, we get to a certain point in life where we continue to have these things that we struggle with, right? Where we've got, um, you know, maybe there's uh, unforgiveness. There, there's someone that we continue to have this kind of lingering bitterness and resentment towards. Maybe someone who wronged us in our past. Maybe a parent who wasn't there for us in the way that, uh, that we really wanted and needed them to be there for us. And, and now, later on in life, we struggle to get over that. We struggle to move forward. Maybe we've got these anger issues that uh, for a while we thought it was normal. We thought it was just typical. And now we're seeing some of the consequences of it. And we're like, man, how do I, how do I get a hold of this? How do I get control of this? I, I don't know. Uh, this is kind of... Uh, scaring me even a little bit because it's beyond what I have the ability to control. We have these things that kind of flare up within our internal worlds and lives that impact our relationships in significant ways. And sometimes we don't always know how to address it. And I think so often kind of our knee-jerk response is to say, I just need to do more of the same, more of what has helped me in the past. And so I got to keep reading these Christian and, you know, theological books. I need to keep listening to sermons. I need to keep reading my Bible. I need to uh, keep doing these things. I got to keep listening to worship music and singing with these songs that these are the things that have helped me in the past. And so I'm just going to do more of that now. I'm going to double down on all of this. And, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up in the morning and read and I'll go to bed and I'll spend more time in prayer. And this is what's going to bring about the change within my life. And yet time and time again, we throw ourselves into these things only to find that they haven't impacted us anymore. And I think it's because part of, what, part of what's involved in the life that Jesus invites us into is community, is relationships. And sometimes what it takes to actually be able to get under the surface in some of these issues is not just listening to another sermon or watching another debate, but instead having the chance in a trusted 
relationship to open up about the things that we've been through, about the things that have been done to us, about what we're struggling with, what we're wrestling with, and to be able to do so in a relationship where we know what we'll be met with is love and acceptance and embrace. So often we opt for the other things because we don't have to run that risk, right? We don't have to run the risk that someone's going to uh, condemn us or shame us or reject us, right? No one's going to do that to you when you're listening to a sermon. But if I open up and let people know what's actually happening on the inside, they might respond in that way. But when we run the risk of doing that, and letting people actually see us for who we are and they choose to meet us with love, that is an experience of the gospel that changes us the first time we experience it and the hundredth time we experience it. Because in order to move forward, we need other people. And the flip side is that other people need you also. Uh, in line with that, um, you know, we see this when we look at First Thessalonians, but also uh, to bring the Surgeon General back out, um, we also have this quote in the positive sense of, about how beneficial connection can be. We've already seen how negative it can be when it's missing, but um, the Surgeon General says that social connection is beneficial for individual health and also improves the resilience of our communities. Evidence shows that increased connection can help reduce the risk of serious health conditions such as heart disease, stroke, dementia, and depression. Communities where residents are more connected with one another fare better on several measures of population health, community safety, community resilience when natural disasters strike, prosperity, and civic engagement. That is one of the reasons why our hope here at SMCC is that this could be a place where regardless of what you believe and where you're at and what has taken place within your past, that this could be some place that you come to and have the ability to develop relationships here, to belong even before you believe and have the chance to be supported in relationships and even support other people as well, to have the connection that each and every one of us are made for. But here's the pinch. If you wait until you need it, you won't have it when you want it. If you wait until disaster strikes, the relationships that we need to weather the storm won't be there so it's a matter of forming the relationships now. Now we're getting close to the end of the time here. I'll be done soon, I can promise you that. But, uh, but before that, um, there's just one, one last thing I want to kind of consider. And I think it's important to ask this question. Because I think we watch sitcoms and we see relationships and community there that we wish that we had. And we know that we want that within our own lives. So many of us, I think, can feel that. And yet, so often our impulse or our kind of the actions that we take, the decisions that we make actually kind of move us away from community. That's so oftentimes when we're struggling with anxiety or we're in the midst of feeling low or something uh, blows up in one of our relationships and we're angry or we're frustrated about it or we're trying to sort through something. So often um, we don't reach out to other people, that we don't reach out to the connections that are most significant within our lives for help within those times. And my question is why? If we know that community is so important, if we know that connections are so helpful, why don't we lean into the relationships we have when we really need them? And I think there's a couple of reasons. On the one hand, I think it might be because we have some sense that to do so is weakness. To admit and acknowledge our need for someone else and to ask someone else to meet our needs feels like weakness. And so I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm there to meet the needs of other people, but when it comes to me, I'm good, I'm fine, I can take care of that. Uh, I don't need anyone else, right? Because that's what we think strength is. And to do the opposite is weakness. And yet when we look to the life of Jesus, one of the things we see is that he intentionally developed these relationships with his disciples who were his students, but they also were his friends. And, and one of the most... Um, emotionally charged in difficult moments of his life, the final night of his life, knowing all that's to come throughout the night and into the morning where he would be arrested, he would be put on trial, he would be condemned to die, he would be beaten, and ultimately he would be lifted up on a cross to be executed before a public, before a crowd, ashamed in front of them. On the front end of all of this, as he was spending time in prayer, he asked his disciples to be with him and to pray for him. He acknowledged his need for others and he asked them to meet the needs that he had. And so if God himself and the person of Jesus was willing to acknowledge his needs and ask others to meet them, then I think that gives us permission to do the very same thing in our own lives. 
And so I think for some of us that can be the reason. But, but I think if there was another reason at play for us, it would have to do with that I think sometimes we look at the needs within our own lives and we just don't, we don't want to be a bother to other people. And, and really the conviction that's underlying that is that we don't think we're worth being a bother. That we don't think we matter enough to burden other people with our needs. We don't think we're significant enough, that we have value enough to bother other people. For example, if I've got needs, I need to work through some things, I need to talk through this, and yet if I think that I don't really matter, then I'm not going to reach out to anyone to say, hey, can you be there with me to process this? I just need some help. I need some encouragement. Uh, I just need someone to, to support me in this. If I believe that my needs matter because I matter, then I'm willing to do that. But if I don't, if my fundamental conviction is that I don't matter, then I'm not going to reach out to anyone when I'm struggling. And if that is a conviction that you yourself have struggled with, whether it's been voiced or not, whether it's been conscious or not, if that is something that has shaped your life, my encouragement to you would just be to turn your attention to the cross every time you're faced with that decision of do I reach out or do I not? Because what we see in the cross is that God himself, the one who created you, who brought you into being, who knows everything there is absolutely to know about you, loved you so much that he was willing to take on our humanity and the person of Jesus, step into our existence, live the perfect life that you and I could never live so that he could give himself on the cross, entering into even death itself so that he could rise in victory over it and invite you into the life and relationship with him that you were made for. He was willing to meet your needs, even going to death itself in order to do so without you having vocalized them or asked for it at all because he knows you matter that much. That is the value that Jesus himself places upon you, that he was willing to die for you. And if he says that you matter that much, then from that place, from that conviction, we can absolutely in our highs and in our lows and in everything in between, we can reach out to the people within our lives who we know are for us, who we know love us, who we trust, to say, hey, I'm going through something. Can you support me in this? And so the bottom line is, treat others to an experience of the gospel. And at the same time, be willing to invite others to do the same for you. Because if we're to support one another over the long haul of life, through the highs and the lows, through the challenges that are not what occur when we stray from the path, they are on the path itself. If we are to persevere through these things with joy and with peace and and to be able to do so in a way that is honoring to Jesus, it will only be with the confidence and the strength that comes from a community that is gospel in nature. And so be willing to ask others to be there for you and be willing to be there for them as well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the time together this morning. We thank you um, that, that so often, um, so often we can go through life with our decisions and our relationships shaped by a certain understanding that we have of ourselves. And yet, one of the things that Um, that you do for us is you correct our sense of even what our own worth, what our own value is, that you are the one who defines that, that you define all of reality, what is good, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, what is true, and what's included within that is your definition of what our value is. And we thank you that you modeled for us what it looks like to live a life that is uh, designed for relationship and what it looks like to lean on those relationships to be willing to be there for others, yes, absolutely, but also to be willing to ask others to be there for us so that over time, in community, in these relationships, we could understand the gospel intellectually but also experience it relationally and be changed again and again and again through that experience. We thank you and we praise you. In your name, amen. Would you stand as we sing this last song? It's so easy in today's world to hold on to the hurts that we have and the insecurities that we have, but it's also just as easy to hold on to all the good things and the crowns and put that in the way of our relationship with God. So right now, I just want us to be in full surrender, to live our lives that way, but to concentrate on that right now. Is
Fantastic week and we'll see you next Sunday. You are dismissed.